So today I'm going to do a little video on this thing. Now I did a video on this previously, I'm going to link into that video at the end of this video. So after you finish watching this one, go watch the previous video where I did a refurbishment on it and found a few problems with it. And if you've got one of these or you're going to intend to buy one of these things, you definitely want to watch that video. This has got one outstanding issue which I found today and I need to fix it. Keep watching to find out what that is. Can I fix it? Well yes I can because I've already done it. But I thought I'd dive into it a little bit and show some video on what I did what I did to find it and what I did to fix it. Brief little revisit on this Heathkit IT28. Now I was going to figure out if, if I could fit this on my bench somewhere because it would be nice to have this on my bench. I've had it in storage since I did an initial repair on it and you know refurbishment or whatever I did onto it. So I placed some caps and things like that in it and, and give it a bit of an overhaul. I thought it was okay but I went to go and just try some stuff on it today because I was thinking oh, I might just try and set up on the desk here somewhere and it wouldn't work properly. So I'm going to demonstrate it to you. So I've got a capacitor here mystery capacitor hooked up generator is on internal AC is powered on it will come on in a second let's turn on the main supply you've got a power factor correction here a very slight one which I know is right for this particular capacitor voltage doesn't matter because we're in bridge mode so let's see if we can figure out what this capacitor is now I actually know that it should be around here somewhere there it is there all right so there it is that's working just fine right now you can see that the eye opened up See the eyes open there, all right? So closed, when it opens, that's where you got the capacitive value. Right there. But right now it's working. For the past four hours, it hasn't been. <laughs> and I've been sitting here tracing through all the circuitry, tracing every wire, couldn't find anything wrong with the wiring or any components. I did find a reference capacitor, which is a bit out of whack, so I've actually replaced that. But this is what I have found. See this? See that moving? Closing up. All I'm doing is wiggling this switch. Look at that. Now I've actually been cleaning these switches as well, but it's still not right. So that's actually for sure. This switch has been sitting in a dirty spot. And it's it's got slightly better now, but before it was just always shut. Didn't matter, I couldn't find a capacitance value. Yeah. So um I want to show you something. And that capacitor is a 0.22 microfarad. That's basically bang on. Not bad, is it? Just above 20. I'm on the uh, times 0.01 range. All right, so that's actually really accurate. When it is working, it's accurate, which is good. When I had this thing apart, I thought I'd check these capacitors out because I wasn't sure if they were actually working okay, just in case they'd gone bad. You've got this original 0.02, which is a 20 nanofarad. That's barely in spec. It's like 2% high. It's like, yeah, okay. But this other one here is a 200 picofarad. That, that red one there, which you can probably, that one there, which I've clipped, that's 200 picofarad. And that was measuring 240 picofarad. It's like, that's a bit too far out. So uh, I've put in two 100 picofarads in parallel to make 200. So that's actually way closer than the original one, this little dice one. It's a shame, would have been nice to keep it original, but that capacitor is way out of whack. So here is the back of the switch, which does the leakage, that's position there, Discharge that position there, and bridge in that position there. And now you can see I've cleaned the switches up, it's all nice and shiny. I've used uh, like these little cotton bud sticks, which are really quite good ones. They don't leave much behind, just a little bit of cotton on the end there. So we've got the scrubbing stuff. And I've got into all these switches and stuff with those. And I've also used my little fiberglass brush as well, into the ones which I can access, which is like this one here. I've used a fiberglass brush on that too. Obviously you can't get into the actual fingers themselves. You can't get into the actual plates, but they're still you know, half the corrosion gone. What I've been looking at is which switch contact is giving me the trouble. So I've actually been going around, I looked at the circuit diagram because I've got that available to me here, and I've hooked up to each connection which is currently made in the bridge position, so I can measure through the switch to make sure the switch contacts are good. And they're all been good, apart from one, which is all it takes. So I'm just gonna hook this up now, which is these two here, which is actually the input side here, please or not the input side, and this one here. Right, right now it's made. At least I know exactly which switch contact that is which is giving me the trouble. 
I've gone through and, through and checked every single combination and that one is the one which is bad. So I need to try and see what I can do to fix that. It's on the back of the switch, it's like the most awkward section to get to. Yeah. But I've already had to switch out once, which is why I've got the knob not fitted. I was just trying to clean the back of it a little bit and try and exit and trying to tell what's going on. And I couldn't really tell, which is why I hooked the multimeter up in continuity mode through the switch to see which contact is breaking with the movement. And this whole thing is actually moving a little bit. This wafer does actually move on the mechanism as well. It's not really well crimped in there. It's only got like two crimp points here. And it has a bit of a wobble in it and all sorts of stuff. So at least I know it's these two connections here. So I've got to try and get to them to fix that. Yay. So here is the circuit diagram for this particular unit, or the IT28 series I should say. This is a quite low res circuit diagram, but here's the inputs over here, and this is the switch we we're looking at, it's just here. So let's go to a closer one, this one's high res. So there's the inputs, positive negative input, negative input goes to the switch, goes through the other switching array here, and basically it's grounded in a way. And then the positive comes in, goes through this wafer here. This is pin 16 and pin 17, which we're having trouble with. Right, this is one I was found the connection problem was. So pin 17 goes out. One side comes down to this transformer, and the other side goes up to the other circuitry, right, which disappears off. So that is the connections we're having problems with. So that's why it didn't work because the input was basically being completely disconnected by that being open circuit. Now, when you're doing the leakage test, leakage is fine. Because when you do leakage, you move the switch into this position here, leakage, which moves this wafer around by two. All right, so discharge moves it by, by, by one, which gets it to this resistor, which dumps the power out of the, the capacitor, right? 10 watt resistor dumps power out. Then you go around one more, that connects this 16 to pin number two, which is on this side, right? It's the opposite side of the wafer, but it's the same pin, so you can use the same correspondence right so 16 will go to 2 and pin 2 is the, actually the output which goes through so it routes it around so when you're in leakage it goes to pin 2 which means it does the power supply testing and in bridge mode it's doing a balance mode which is different those two pins there is what's giving trouble one warning I should give you if you ever work on anything like this and it's tube gear be very careful what you touch don't touch as much as you can as avoid touching as much as you can inside the chassis especially when it's on even when it's off these caps can be charged up to hundreds of volts so you have to be careful about what you're touching don't just poke your fingers in there like you would do for you know normal low power digital gear you wish you could normally get away with that that's fine you don't really matter even when the power's on you get away with it this stuff you get quite a jolt so be very careful about what you're doing in these things these will give you a zap if you're not careful you have to treat tube gear with respect so just there are the switch contacts, which I'm looking at here. Let's try and activate so you can see the thing moving. It's not exactly easy. See that wafer moving there? All right, that's the position it should be in to do the testing. I've already got it in there, give it a bit of a clean. You can see a bit of polishing there. All right. And it's moving over that way, so that's now not making contact anymore. And move it down some more. Next position. All right, so it's that's the way from trying to clean is that wafer there and unfortunately I can't get to the contacts to clean them because of the way it sits but that's the wafer and that's the contact there which I need to try and get as clean as I can and hopefully that will fix the problem so it doesn't actually move that contact there it didn't really move when it came up to hit it so I think what I need to do is actually push that contact down move that contact out of the way move that down a bit and then hopefully it will make contact a lot better Try that. And let's just push it down a little bit, just a little bit. Okay. Quick contact. Then move it back. And hopefully it will slide underneath nicely. See it lift up then? Hopefully it goes back down again when I move it back out of the way. It's a bit awkward. See it lifted then? So that's probably going to be good. Now the only question is, is if it's the wiper, the main wiper there, which is that one, which is giving trouble, that's not so easy to fix because it never actually drops down, it's always on it. So I can't just like do what I did that one, just push it down a bit. So hopefully it is that one. Let's try it again. Right, let's see if this is any different. 
hook it up to there, put in that mode, get a wiggle, yeah, that solved it, that fixed now, excellent, let's plug it back in and see if it works. So iTube is on, let's do bridge, here we go, there it is, give the switch a wiggle, it's fine, look at that, fixed, excellent, and you can see there it's just about 20, also do the um, power factor compensation as well there. Yeah, it's quite at 22, just under 22. Now, I actually measured this in a capacitance tester, and it's uh, 218 nanofarad. So that is actually looking bang on. Let's try another capacitor, shall we? Now, I've got this one here, which is looking really sad. It's a bit rusty, and I've had it sitting in the drawers for a long time. Also, it doesn't weigh very much. Let's see what we get out of this one. This could be interesting. So it's 16 volt, 100 microfarad, apparently. So it's a big difference. Need to change ranges to times one. Put it on that. So 100 microfarad... So 100 is actually off the top of the scale. Well, there we go, it's come up, up here. So it's actually off the top of scale up there. So it's actually up there. So let's do extended scale. And there we go, around there somewhere. Extended scale. Let me hook up to my other meter here. I'll tell you what it gets. That gets 126 microfarad. So the way of actually doing this is if we got a 100 microfarad cap. So we can actually get another capacitor of a known value, put on these terminals and compare it to it. So we'll do that. So I put in a capacitor here which I measured just now as 102 microfarad. So if we go to external standard, if we go to bottom here of 1, let's hook this capacitor back up again because I've disconnected it. Bridge mode. So you're going to be close, so it's going to be slightly more. So that's about 1.22, would you say that is? What do you measure it as? 124, was it? 126? It works as a comparison. So should we check leakage as well? This could be interesting. This is a 16 volt cap, wasn't it? Let's check it. 16 volt, yep. Leakage. Um, there we go. Even 3 volt took a while to go. 6 volts. Still closed. This is a leaky cap. I've still got a set of min electric though, so I might actually have to increase that. Let's do that, that might help a little bit. Okay. So 3 volts, 6 volts, 10 volts, 15 volts. It's only a 16 volt cap. But really, this one here. Should be kind of doing it. I mean, I don't know obviously it is, but let's go 25 volts, which is above this cap rating. Straight, yeah. So, yeah, I think the min electric, min, minimum electrolytic position should actually be doing it. This should test this cap here we use as a reference. So now, how type the cap we use as a reference? Leakage mode, min electric. We'll start the low voltage again, start three. And it uses really low counts. Here we go, there's three. There's six volts. So this is low current, this is high current. Still high current then. Here we go, high current. 10 volts, 15 volts. This is a 35 volt cap. So 25 volts, no worries. And if we go down now, that shuts again. So it's actually not too dissimilar. I haven't actually used this thing really. I've done the repair and tear downs and, and refurbishment of it. Haven't really used it that much. I'm still getting used to it and how to best use it. I mean, electrolytic is where I think it should be, but I thought this one would work for some stuff. I know it does work on smaller caps like I tested it on this one here. It did actually work just fine on the minimum electrolytic. It looks like it actually requires that. I'll do 50 volts. Yeah, I'm going to get there with it. Come back down again and it's done it. There we go. So I think it might actually have some leakage. Might actually have some leakage on that one. Maybe it's true. 
So I've just hooked up another cap. This is a 100 microfarad again, 160 volt this time. All right, so let's do leaky test again. I'm going to start low levels again using minimum currents. They open up pretty quickly, that's quite good. Again, good. So I'm expecting to see it open at, I'm still expecting the CD to be open at 25 volts as well. Okay. The other cap wouldn't open at 25. I think this one will. Because that will be, you know, much higher voltage threshold on it. Might take a while though. That's 15 volts right now. Okay, it's too big electrolytic. Open, bang, 25, which I think we were the other one. Put it back to minimum, and it's closed up again. Interesting. Oh, high current. That one there, that one there. 100, leakage is good. On. 150, don't touch the cables. <laughs> and that is opening up. It's fine. So, wind it back down again. Yeah, I don't know. Discharge. Always discharge before you take the cap back off, always get a zap. That switch seemed to be the problem with this. It drove me nuts for hours. I always wish I'd noticed the switch was being dodgy. Because I checked it and checked it and checked it. When I was probing the switch with my multimeter leads, I was pushing on it a little bit and it's making contact. <sighs> <laughs> It took me hours to figure that out. Once I actually got it so I could see the eye opening on a capacitor, then I realised actually now the switch is playing up. Anyway, got there in the end. It's now fully working, as it seems to be. I'll put the cover back on and I'll see if I can find a space for it on my desk here somewhere. Somewhere. Can you see a gap? No? Hmm. That could be a problem. But I do want to have this on my desk. I do want it here, so when I want to do capacitor testing and check for leakage, I will have the means to do it. I'm not sure where I'm going to put it, it's any problem. So if you found it interesting, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Patreon support link over there to help you buy a piece of test gear like this thing, which I use Patreon money to buy, so I can do repair videos about them. Catch you later.